And here are the questions that we're going to be getting to today. The first is, if I submit a photo to convert from 2D to 3D on Cockpit 3D, and the customer changes their mind and actually wants to get a larger or perhaps a smaller crystal, do I have to resubmit the photo, losing time, waiting for the conversion, as well as losing additional credits? Number two is, why should I even use Cockpit 3D if I could use an alternate converter online? We'll get to that. And the third, can you talk about some of the advanced features beyond simply clicking on the go and the save button? So for answers to this and more, stick around. Cockpit 3D brought to you by 3dcrystal.com is next. And welcome to Cockpit 3D, brought to you by 3dcrystal.com. So first and foremost, I'm gonna ask that if you haven't already, please do join our Cockpit 3D Facebook page, as well as our subsurface laser engraving community that we've set up on Facebook. The links are displayed below. For the first question, if you have submitted a photo to have converted from 2D to 3D and you've received a scene file back, customer might want to change the size of the crystal. They might want to change the inscription that you had asked to place in the crystal at the time you placed your order. Well, that's the power of Cockpit 3D. It gives you the flexibility to do exactly what you need to do to change the sizes, to change the text in order to accommodate the customer's request. So let me show you how. Here's a 3D conversion. Customer decided to get an iceberg shaped crystal. Now they've decided that they want to change their mind and they actually want to put it into a 3D rectangle large, for example. There you go. You're able to do it. Now, let's say, for example, they ordered this without inscription. You have the 3D file. They now want to add inscription. Simply click on the letter T over here. You can type whatever you want. You can select your font and you can now place it to position. Don't forget to always look at the side and move it closer to the front, it looks a lot better. Second question, why should I use Cockpit 3D? Well, the reality is you don't have to. You could use an online converter to convert a flat image from 2D to 3D. What we're told is that the quality of what you're getting isn't sellable to a customer. However, it is interesting for someone that wants to tinker, play with, maybe create some hobbies on their own. It's definitely doable and you don't have to use Cockpit 3D. Let me tell you what Cockpit 3D has been made for. I'll take it back a step. We created Cockpit 3D for our own usage. It was never created as a software that was intended to be licensed out. We run 3dcrystal.com and we run that website globally. And for our own use, to be able to create very easily and efficiently the best quality 3D crystals, we designed and came out with Cockpit 3D. And it didn't just happen like that. This software is now a decade in the making, at least at this point and the point that you're actually starting to use it. Um, however, uh, when we did come out with it many years ago, we had competitors that had lasers, saw what we had, and were very interested in utilizing Cockpit 3D for their business. We are all about collaboration over competition. I firmly believe that when the tide comes in, all boats should rise. And that's the reason why we started to share Cockpit 3D and license it out. So this has been created really as a platform to help you provide you the technology to grow your business. And if that's what you're intending to do, that's what the software is for. It will help get you the best quality efficiently and it consistently improves because my job is to be two to three years ahead. So what you're seeing right now was baked a few years ago. And what we're gonna be seeing a couple of years from now is being baked today, right here in my mind. So uh, Cockpit 3D is a platform again for you to use as a way to generate revenue for your business. Now, another reason and what keeps us ahead as far as our quality is concerned is, and I've showed this to you in another video. You see that scanner there? That scanner has traveled with me and with my team for over 20 years. And we've scanned people, we've scanned pets, we've scanned artifacts, we've scanned buildings and objects and vehicles, and we have millions of files that are true 3D data that has given us an amazing data set. If you do your research on what makes artificial intelligence different, the usage or the creation of tools using AI, how is one company better than another? It all boils down to the data that they have. Those that have organized, clean data are going to outperform on the tools that they provide and create in the AI world over other companies that just don't have the data or have data, but it's just not organized in the way that it needs to be. So that's the reason why currently you're able to get the most accurate 2D to 3D conversions on so many different types of photos that you're uploading. I've heard stories of people uploading motorbikes and getting amazing 3D. Some people have uploaded their pet bunny. Uh, another person has uploaded buildings and flags and 
just different types of objects. Someone was doing a corporate project for an airline and very, very interesting photos coming in that we didn't even test, but because of our high quality data set, we were able to generate good quality 3D for you. Uh, additionally, uh, many of you are on currently a trial license of Cockpit 3D for the UV world. We came out with this because again, we wanted to be able to provide a solution very quickly uh, for those that were hitting a roadblock in being able to create good quality 3D crystal. And we wanted to create a subscription model that would justify a UV owner using their machine more as a hobbyist, as opposed to someone that has a green beam machine that would be generating if not hundreds, thousands of dollars in a single day, uh, as we've seen with people that have our 3D LaserBox Jet Mini. All right, so the third question, getting into some of these advanced features, we go to settings. Let's take a look. I've already explained XY distance and Z layer distance, right? XY is the point space setting on the X and the Y. When I say 07, I mean 0 0.07, not just 07, okay? So 0 0.07, same thing for the Z layer distance for UV. Uh, I would keep it the same as my XY. So if you're doing your XY at 06, make sure your Z is at 06. Uh, for the Jet Mini and all of you who are using it, you can keep this at 0.14. Toning is pretty much always kept at 1.8. I used to use this for controlling the contrasts on the texture of the 3D model. However, we don't really need to use this anymore. You can play around with it if you want, but really we don't need to use this anymore because of cinematic HD. So when you are entering your photo for conversion to 3D on Cockpit 3D's FastPass portal and you click on cinematic HD, that's gonna do the magic at ensuring that it optimizes the best tones, the best lighting, contrast, lights and darks, etc. okay? So um, we really don't need to touch this. Uh, trim point cloud to templates. So if we, actually let's not check that and if we, increase this and it's not checked off when we click on go what do you think is going to happen so it is going to create the entire point cloud it's not going to trim it to the inner safety margin versus when we turn it on it will click on go and it'll now keep it within the safety margin that we have set okay layer shift and z jitter these are different variables for how the points are scattered and we played around with this uh to cater to different laser types. And so you can play around with it if you'd like, but I would always recommend one variable at a time, okay? So if you're gonna play with layer shift, don't touch Z jitter. Otherwise, you're not gonna know what did what, all right? Um, but if you play around with it, you'll see how it kind of changes the behavior of where the points are scattered and how they're scattered, and it will um, enable you to kind of do a comparison. Blur radius. So we went through this and the fall off exponent in another video. So this has to do with light maps. And maybe I'll do a quick demo of that here just as a reminder, um, because I think repetition will help a lot of you. So let's start with 3D heart small, click on OK. And you can already see the light map, right? It's along the edge there. And be careful because if you click on go like this right now, it's not going to look cool because you're going to have this edge here and this space. So that doesn't look really nice for a customer. So really try and take it all the way to the edge. And because we don't want his head so close to the top, we can move it down. Now, again, just to explain what this is, I'm gonna to go to the extreme, I'm gonna change this to 10, which is kind of like 10 millimeters. My fall off exponent, I'm also gonna go very high at 10. It will increase the time for it to process. And now that it's done, you can see that it's starting at about 10 millimeters or one centimeter away from the edge. And also the fall off exponent, it's falling off um, a lot quicker too, because I increased that number from 0.5 to 10. So it's not ideal for this, but again, this was an extreme example. If I change this here now to 0.5, but I keep this 10, you should see that it starts the fade at, oh, I didn't really need to click on go. Um, it's gonna do the light map first anyway. But it, you should see that it starts the fade at the 10 millimeter mark, but then you can see here it fades it slower and you can almost see it already near the edge. Okay. However, we like the settings 3.0 and 0.5. Okay, let's move on. So we've taken care of all of these. Create stabilizing points. This is a cool one, okay? This is really, really interesting. So you know when um, you use, or maybe you don't know because you've used just rectangles so far perhaps, but if you start getting into some unique shapes, so something like our Iceberg Prestige, let's do that, the Iceberg Prestige small. Now let's say for example, I move this because I want to center him, okay? And I click on go and I save my point cloud and I load it on a laser. So lasers have this tendency of auto-centering the point cloud. And so in order to avoid that, 
what we do is we have a stabilizing point. And when we turn this on, it creates a floating point in the corners to keep that image burning exactly where I see it on my screen. So that should be of interest to all of those that are listening right now or watching. And for the competitors that are watching or the competitors that are looking to try and copy Cockpit 3D, um, you might want to rewind and turn your volume up because this is a key point, okay? Um, and by the way, I'm all about collaboration and sharing and teaching. Um, in fact, uh, when we are working on Cockpit 3D, we're always improving it um, every week. Whether you see it on the front end or not, something's being improved on the back end. When I teach at the university, I tell my students it's all about perpetual innovation, consistently raising the bar. So um, we can keep the stabilizing point on and it will ensure that it loads it in your laser software at the exact same position that you've seen it on your screen. Now this might cause a problem with UV lasers because those floating points might end up being outside of that six or seven centimeter field of view that your lasers are able to do. Um, and so therefore, um, you might need to turn that off and manually move the image or the point cloud in your laser where you want it to be, okay? Um, never resize a point cloud. So you can move the point cloud in your laser software, but don't resize it, okay? Because if you resize it, it's gonna cause all kinds of weird artifacts. It'll either make it look really bad or it'll start cracking. And so you don't wanna ever resize a point cloud. Okay, that's rule number one. All right, let's move on. Edit geometry defaults. So um, we have two modes, projection and portrait, um, and, and another one, x-ray, which right now is far advanced. So we're not gonna even talk about that right now. We're just gonna talk about um, portrait and projection. So projection, you don't need, okay? Projection is something we used to use um, in the old world. And if you ever do send us orders that you want us to do with a human artist, um, that's when you can uh, evaluate projection. But really, you don't need projection. It's portrait all the time. So now, what does portrait mode enable you to do? And why do we have it there? So um, I'll explain. Let me just make this here point zero, point zero, save. Okay, and I'm gonna click on go. Now, this particular part of the tutorial is specifically for the viewer that wrote in asking about how to remove shadows, okay? So if we take a look at this point cloud and turn it around, you'll notice that there is a shadow here on the wall, okay? And the reason for that shadow, right, is because when we are creating points or casting these points, the camera is able to do it based on what it can see. So when I click on go, it's like me shooting forward and generating points for whatever I can see from this vantage point. So if, for example, you were standing in front of a white wall in a dark room, and well, perhaps it doesn't need to be a white wall, but let's say you're standing in front of a wall in a dark room and someone turns on a flashlight, faces it straight at you. Behind you, there's gonna be a shadow. Right? And that's exactly what's happening here. So in order to help distract the obvious nature of this shadow, what we did is we created portrait mode and we control filling that shadow ever so slightly with points so that it fills it, it looks less obvious to the human eye. That's all we're doing. We wanna make it a little bit more discreet so it doesn't interrupt the human eye. I would beg the question that why even have this white wall there in the first place? It's gonna increase your burn time. It's not pretty to look at, but the point being made here is it's a great image to actually show and demonstrate this. You can see now it filled it up more. And I don't know if I really like that, to be honest. I think that's a little overkill. So um, generally we would set this uh, at three. And if there happens to be any, um, any shadows, then in that case, it will slightly fill up the space and make it look less obvious. All right. Now, the other question, and I think this is gonna be my final point for today, is backgrounds. So let's say, for example, you decided to keep the background, you got it converted with a background as this particular customer did, and now they realize that, you know what? I don't want these people here. or I want to blur these people's faces out or I want to remove the white wall. How can I do it? So on the premium version of Cockpit 3D, which is the version that runs on Windows here, um, you would click on this brush to take it to your graphics editor. So I've installed Photoshop here and it's a very old version of Photoshop, but it does the trick. 
And over here, what I'm able to do is make a change. So I'm not gonna spend much time on it, but I'll make a point here. Cause you're all smart and you'll understand all of this. So, all right, so let's just assume, whoops. Okay. So I wanna get rid of that, okay? So, and let me just do one other thing. Let me add a layer here. So for whatever reason, I decided I also wanted to go to my curves and I wanted to increase the brightness a bit. Okay. So the first thing you need to make sure you do is you see there's two layers here. Make sure that you merge those layers. If there happens to be two layers, had I not added the curve, there wouldn't have been two layers. So if there are, make sure you merge them. The next thing you do is control S. Okay. So just do a quick save and then go back here and click on refresh. Okay. And now it has removed it. Isn't that cool? So you are able to make changes to the texture even after you have received your 3D file back. So you can see all the thinking that has gone into Cockpit 3D and it doesn't stop. For the stuff that we're gonna be coming out with, it's just next level, okay? But for now, um, this is still super advanced and um, you'll enjoy the flexibility that it offers you. So if I wanted to now make another change, here's another tip, don't go back to Photoshop and make a change there. You have to click on the brush again. Let it launch the new texture now, the one that has this part of the image removed. And now do your next change. Control S, come back, refresh, and now it does my next change, okay? Now there's another question is, let's say for example, you wanna do it a different way and we have another alternate way of doing it, which is by cutting out points. So not necessarily doing it on the texture, but doing it on the point cloud. So you see these tools here? They're all grayed out right now, but the moment I go to point cloud mode, now these become alive, right? And so what I can do is I can pretty much look at it from the top or from an angle or from a side and I can do what I want to do. So let me take this rectangle here and I'm just going to cut out. It doesn't really cut it. What it does is it hides it. You see it says hide there. Don't go and click on the trash can. Common mistake. If you click on that, it'll delete your entire layer. Okay, you don't want to do that. So we're just going to click on this here and you can see it's taking most of it out. And now I can use my free hand if I want. Okay. So again, many different roads taking you to that same final destination. All right. And at the end of the day, make sure that um, if you've adjusted the point clouds here and you're ready to rock and roll with this and send it to your laser, make sure you save it. Because if you click on go again, you're going to lose all the, all the edits that you did in point cloud mode. Okay, so you'll still have the edits you did on your texture in Photoshop, right, this, but anything that you had cut out with this, you'll lose it if you click on go again. So you wanna make sure you click on save once you're happy with your point cloud, and then you're ready to burn the project. Okay, I hope you found that helpful. I hope that you succeed in your businesses. Please don't forget to subscribe, like, share, and also um, I wanna thank you for the posts that you guys are sharing on Facebook communities. Although you might see a lot of our ads on Facebook, I personally haven't been jumping onto Facebook that much, so I'm hearing from my team who speaks to many of you um, about all the positive feedback out there. Thank you very much. Please join our Facebook community and hopefully I'll get a little more active out there as well. Take care.